brought to you by CGTN Europe. Hello, I'm Stephen Cole. Welcome to the Agenda podcast. In this episode, we'll be looking at the future of news, including the challenges facing the industry and how the way we get our information is changing. First on the podcast, I speak to David Boardman, former editor of the Seattle Times and dean of Temple University in Philadelphia. He'll be telling us how newsrooms are countering the fake news epidemic and addressing tensions between the public and the press. Obviously, we're at a time of tremendous chaos and disruption in the world of journalism. Um, we have uh, disinformation rampant. Um, we have uh, nonstop 24-hour news cycles in which important news sometimes gets consumed by the latest headlines. Um, we have intentional manipulation of news by people in power. We have uh, very aggressive uh, attacks on journalists by people in power really around the world and um, certainly in, in the States, and, and I know this is the case in much of Europe, um, the biggest crisis in news is actually at the local and regional level where we've seen just the, the decimation of, of news uh, sources. And that's exactly right, isn't it? Thousands of newspapers are closing because they're losing their advertising revenues to Google and Facebook. And these local newspapers are very important to community for a variety of reasons. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think the crisis in local news is, is actually the true crisis in democracy because that is where citizens really touch their government. And it's frankly where the most funny business can go on. It's where the most corruption uh, is undoubtedly occurring, and there's nobody there at the city council meeting uh, looking at the police station, in the courts, um, at the school boards, and, and that's a very, very dangerous uh, situation. I agree. Much of the latest 24-hour news journalism doesn't really extend beyond the headlines. Today, it's all opinion-based, isn't it, David? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And in fact, I would say that in the United States, uh, in terms of our national news, um, there really is very little news. Um, if you tune in to uh, CNN, MSNBC, and, and Fox News, um, the three networks that purport to, to be our 24-hour news channels, 90% um, of what you see on those channels is actually commentary, analysis, um, in many cases, you know, six or eight or ten talking heads uh, screaming over each other. So there's there's really not a lot of news that's actually be pr been presented and and uh, consumed there. On the other hand, um, I think there's there's been lots of research that shows that um, people around the world and certainly in in this country and yours are consuming news at a far greater level than they ever have before. People say. Um, to interviewers that they're turning away from news, but in fact, in social media um, and, and digitally, uh, particularly, they're consuming more, they're spending more time uh, consuming news and analysis than they ever have before. There's a growing demand for solution-based journalism. What is that, David? Solutions-based journalism, I think, is a big part of the answer for the future and, and certainly something that can bring a lot more trust and validation to news. And, and what it is, uh, the way I define it, and I've been practicing this uh, as a journalist and, and as a news leader for, for more than a decade, solutions journalism says it's not enough to just know the problem and to identify and expose the problem. We need to expose the public to um, productive responses to that problem. And so Solution journalism doesn't advocate for a particular course of action to a problem, but it does explore and expose readers to potential responses that have been successful elsewhere and that might be successful in a particular location. And, and again, it's very data-based, it's very evidence-based, it's rigorous reporting, it's not happy news, it's not fluff, um, but it is rigorous reporting that helps the citizens figure out where to go on a problem and how to fix problems. And ultimately, it brings more accountability to public officials because no longer can the mayor of a city say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do about it, or 
that that would cost too much money. Uh, an example would be, for instance, uh, let's say a city has a tremendous problem, as many American cities do, with uh, graffiti in public places. Well, maybe that problem has been successfully addressed in Oslo, Norway, and we can say to the mayor of Denver, Colorado, well, they fixed it in Oslo, and here's how they did it. You can do it, too. Do you think, David, there's also a crisis of trust? People are asking, where do I get my news from? Where can I find the facts that I can believe? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what's happened over the last 10 years, we saw a phenomenon where uh, readers and viewers and listeners migrated into these information silos where they were simply looking for validation. Um, they, the news sources and their audiences became extremely tribal. And breaking out of that now uh, is going to be really, really challenging. But I, I know that there are a lot of people who are uncomfortable at, at either pole and who are in the middle and who are looking for something more, looking for validation. But I think it's also important to remember that these times of chaos and disruption in, in a variety of, of professions and, and industries over time often um, result in positive change. And I think we're already starting to see some things emerge that, that are hopeful and optimistic. How should the next generation of newsrooms operate to discuss trust, the battle of the bots, and the platform paradox, I'm joined by Professor Richard Sambrook, former BBC executive and director of the Centre for Journalism at Cardiff University. Alongside him is Professor Lucy Kong, strategic advisor and digital disruption expert, who says social media platforms are the bridges to the next generation. I'm optimistic in the sense that people need news and will always need news, so there is always going to be a market for it. Um, but uh, news organisations are going through a torrid period of adjustment, and uh, I think that's going to continue for some time. And uh, first, in terms of the disruption to the business model, so their revenues, in terms of having to uh, invest and adapt to new digital platforms, and in terms of trying to understand what their audiences need and what new generations of audiences coming through need, which is rather different from what perhaps their older consumers have wanted. So a lot of disruption, fairly torrid time, but in the long run, people need news and want news, and therefore there will be a market for it. So, Lucy, your work is managing technology shifts, isn't it? Uh, how yes. has the digital shift um, changed the way news is delivered? And what sort of shifts can we expect to see in the future? Well, I mean, what the industry is contending now is, is an enormous structural shift that's been going on for 20 years, actually. They've been adapting to digital for over 20 years now. Um, and now they've got a crisis on top of that. So I kind of completely agree with Richard. People are always going to want news. The question is, who's news? And I think the challenge for classic established media organizations is to understand how news is consumed in the kind of platform world. And it's very different. So essentially, there is a kind of complete overload of news content around now. So the challenge for news organizations is cutting through that, having a strong brand, getting their voice heard. There's no drop in quality in what they're doing. It's just much harder to find it now, I think. And the closer you get to social platforms, the harder that gets. So the challenge for news organizations is the minute their news ends up in social platforms, they lose contact with consumers. They don't really have anything like the granular sense of who's re who is consuming it, who are those people, what do they want? So you might say, oh, well, don't engage with the platforms. The problem is those platforms are the bridges to the next generations. They won't survive unless they find a way to operate on the platforms. And that's the kind of basic dilemma. And, and COVID-19 has just exacerbated that. And is the problem, Richard, really sort of how do we make money from news? The old way of making money through advertising, one way or another, is disappearing. And um, the, the new means of advertising and uh, by trading data and digital advertising and so on, although the, you, you can grow that, it's not to the same level. And, it, it, you know, legacy news organisations have very heavy costs to carry as they try to shift their business model. Um, and, you know, some will go under. And we've already seen, particularly in local news markets, both certainly in, in, um, in Europe and in the US, uh, a lot of news organisations have disappeared and more will go, I think, as they fail to make that adjustment. So the question is, 
how do you make money out of the new digital platforms and digital services? The New York Times is a success story at the moment in that that has, uh, I think, driven its digital services and its, in its digital offerings in a way that has become sustainable for them. But, you know, this will go on changing. It's never going to be a project that's that's finished. It's going to be an ongoing project to continually keep up with technology, keep up with changing consumption habits. Um, and some organizations, the, the bigger brands, the you know more substantial ones that can invest heavily in digital, I think can probably make that cross uh, to the new new world and the new business models. Some of the smaller ones, the local news markets and so on, I think are, are going to have a pretty pretty bad time and they won't all make it. How do you teach uh, somebody to develop quality journalism in this kind of atmosphere? Well, I think there's a, a range of different kinds of services and different kinds of skills that are needed. So at one end, people are competing in the breaking news, kind of commoditized news market, which is highly competitive now. You know, the stuff of notifications on your mobile, you know, stuff flashing up, breaking news and all the rest of it. But at the other end, there is better, deeper, more specialist news and information available than there ever has been, often behind a paywall for subscription. But if you are really interested in a particular niche or specialist area, you can be better served than you've ever been able to be before. Now, the skills for those things are very different, and people entering the profession need to decide where they want to work. Do they want to work in the kind of highly adrenalized breaking news environment, or do they want to go into depth and specialism and so on? And what they have to work very carefully about is really differentiating their brands. And I think one of the problems they've got is they've grown up in a mass era where they've kind of covered everything. And I think one of the things they're going to have to do in this new world is actually decide which areas of news do we have to master competitively and then really work incredibly hard to differentiate. You know, we are the go-to place for politics, for climate, for a corona or whatever, and then work really hard to build that brand in that level. And I mean, the other thing I think which we're seeing is we're seeing individual journalists emerge as kind of quality brands in themselves. You know, that particular writers who are really carving a name, cutting through at the moment, those are the, read those are the writers you go to to have certain things explained. And I think news organizations need to be developing those incredibly strategically important kind of journalist stars as well at the moment. The other thing, Stephen, is that, you know, it used to be the case that news organisations were the gatekeepers. So they would decide what you needed to know and what was important. And, you know, when with less choice, by and large, the public accepted what they were given in the newspaper or on TV. But now with so much information and with technology, the audience, the public has to decide what's important to them because there's so much choice out there. And that's about media literacy in the end. Your students, Richard, I mean, do some of them want to be foreign correspondents? Because these days, foreign correspondents seem in very short supply. And the only foreign news you often see reported, you, you get the impression a reporter has decided what the story is even before he or she has gone to the story. Well, I mean, that's, that's a kind of function of, of financial pressures. So, you know, foreign bureau are very expensive. Foreign correspondents, expats sent abroad on, you know, uh, packages and, uh, to keep them and living there and all the rest of it are quite expensive. And therefore, also the pressures when you, you send someone out from, from your base to get the story and turn it around and get back fast are greater as well. But having said that, uh, the technology that we have also allows more reporting from overseas uh, at a lower cost than ever before. So we're seeing more local reporters reporting for international organisations. And that, I think, is a healthy thing because they're closer to the country, closer to the culture, closer to the story. Um, uh, and that's very healthy to see that being reflected that it isn't all middle-aged white men going and telling you what to think about the world. So there's good news as well as as well as more difficult news around foreign reporting. Um, the other side of that, of course, is it is also more more pressure of a different sort. If you're a local reporter reporting for an international outlet, you're more vulnerable to uh, intimidation and so on if you're reporting on crime and corruption. So it's a complicated picture, but as well as it becoming more expensive to send an expat traditional foreign correspondent out, it's also becoming easier to get local journalists to report their own countries for an international audience. And that's a that's a healthy thing. All right, last question to both of you. I don't want to talk myself out of a job here, but the demographic for people watching 24 Hour News, they're well into their 60s. So are people falling out of love with 24 Hour News and, and news channels, appointment television, bulletins, even though two new channels are forecast in Britain soon? 
I think the appointment-based pro programming, yes. I mean, people are basically permanently plugged into their phones now, permanently looking for updates, permanently looking to see what's 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 happening, what, especially at the moment. So I think essentially, yeah, those very fixed formats um, are changing. But what we've seen with Corona, which is the real present, I think, the real opportunity for classic media organizations, is the whole world's gone digital now. I mean, those 60s plus are now as digitally online, digitally capable, as the kind of younger audiences. So the, the last arguments for hanging on to kind of legacy platforms and formats as defaults are going now. I mean, organizations have absolutely no arguments left. They've got to go much harder into digital. Richard? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that, but it's not a question of either or. And, um, you know, just as other technologies when they've come along haven't necessarily killed off completely the old technology. I mean, you know, radio didn't kill print, television didn't kill radio and so on. The internet's not going to kill television. It's just, undermining it the audiences aren't going to be as great or as strong as, as they have been in the past and organizations have to be able to do a bit of everything so you know a lot of what uh, younger uh, consumers are picking up on their mobile phones comes from big legacy organizations it's video clips that have been formatted for instagram or whatever else it may be so news organizations have just got to learn how to diversify and to format their content and so on uh, in different ways and the one thing i would say is that when covid first hit we saw an enormous spike in TV audiences. So don't don't dismiss the platform that you're on too quickly, Stephen. You'll be <laughs> pleased to hear. Because there are times when, when the world seems to be collapsing around people's ears that they actually do come back to the big screen in their living room to be told what the hell's going on. The Alps, timeless and changing. Every year, we have to add an additional 80 steps. It's losing like six meters of ice every year. Spring is now three to four weeks earlier than it was 50 or 60 years ago. The restaurant is shifted with the glacier beneath it. Climate change, helping to push a hut over the border from one country to another. The Alps, timeless and changing. Online now at cgtn.com forward slash Europe. The world is so connected that we often know within minutes when a major event happens. But are timely updates damaging our well-being? Let's ask Rolf de Belli, the founder of the non-profit foundation World Minds and the author of The Art of Thinking Clearly. The news industry doesn't give you relevance it gives you, it steals attention from you and turns that attention into money. So the business model has always been a little bit skewed for the producers and not the consumers of news, but it's been, it's gone in the wrong direction even more now with online news and then personalized news. What is it, what is it about news that you object to? Is it the content or the way it's delivered or, or the, the, the lack of length? What is it? So, uh, I've been a news junkie for many years, consuming everything I could get my hands on, you know, reading newspapers, watching television, all that stuff. Then online news came, up, came on board. And 10 years ago, after reading hundreds of thousands of news pieces, I asked myself two simple questions. Number one, do I now make, after consuming all this news, do I now make better decisions for my life, either personal life or business life? And I honestly had to say, no, I don't make better decision because of the consumption of news. And the second question I ask myself is, at least do I understand the world better now? And also I had to say no to that. So 10 years ago, I decided to go completely without news, no, te no newspapers, no online news, no television, no radio. And it's been a re very rewarding journey for me. I've saved a lot of time. I have more concentration. I think I see the world clear. And I have way less anxiety. How do you see the world in a clearer way, then, if you don't know what's happening in the world? Well, news don't give you the understanding of the world. They give you the events. Just kind of but see it a, as But there's analysis a, in news as well, isn't there? There is some analysis, but the news pieces generally are too small to give you that analysis. I don't need to know if an airplane crashed somewhere in Siberia. I don't know if a, if a bomb exploded on the left side of a building or the right side of a building in Syria. News give you some analysis, but generally the news pieces are too small. So what I'm looking for is to understand the generators of the events, not just the events on the surface. What are the hidden generators? And for that, I look for long formats, 
you know, five pages, 10 pages, essays, uh, documentaries, and of course, the ultra long format, which are books, which are an excellent format. So uh, you think slow news uh, is the way forward then? In a way, you're absolutely right. Slow news is the way forward. The problem is slow news. These long, thoughtful articles are very hard, very expensive to produce. They take a lot of time to craft. And we haven't found a business model that solves it. In a way, we've had a perfectly slow news model for the last 500 years, which are books. But the new models, the online models, don't really work. We don't have, don't have a grasp yet. But I give you maybe just the, co the contrast to slow news or long pieces versus the short ones. You can read a thousand news pieces about the war in Syria, but you won't understand that war. But one good book that shows you the history of the place, the cultural mix, the people, the geographic, the, the geopolitical interests of the big parties involved, that at least give you a little sense of what's happening in Syria. This is just one example. So going for the generators instead of the little events that's happening. So what you're looking for is perspective, putting the stories into perspective, which is virtually the same as analysis. If you were talking to students, student journalists, what would you be teaching them for the journalism of the future? I would tell them the chances of making big money are slim. So you really have to love your craft. And there are two types of journalists that we need, that you should go into if you are a student. One is investigative journalism. Again, that's expensive to produce and few media companies have the resources to pay for investigative journalists. So look at the powerful people and organizations. Sometimes it's even not even just expensive, it's sometimes dangerous to do that. Uh, and the second one is is that a journalist that gives you perspective, that explains the world. These are, again, the long formats, uh, the big analysis, long pieces, and, again, the budgets there are very, very slim. So you'd have to kind of get a second job to, to, uh, to make the money and do that really from your heart, do that type of journalism really from your heart. And that brings us to the end of another edition of The Agenda. Tune in next time when we'll be looking at the future of war. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify. You can also find us on CGTN Europe Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.